The next item of business today is a member's business debate on motion number 10122 in the name of Alison McInnes on your GP Cares campaign. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put and I would be grateful if those members who wish to speak in the debate could press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. I call on Alison McInnes to open the debate a maximum of seven minutes. Ms McInnes. Officer. I would like to start by thanking those MSPs who supported my motion and enabled it to, to be debated today. The British Medical Association's Your GP Cares campaign emphasises that general practice is the cornerstone of the NHS and at the heart of every community. From prof professionals covering vast remote areas to large city practices, the service that GPs and primary health care teams provide is appreciated the length and breadth of the country and admired across this chamber. Amid a wealth of specialisms and the involvement of departments across the health service and beyond, they are often the only constant during a patient's care, identifying symptoms, assessing needs, signposting to other services and coordinating a joined-up approach to patient's care. This continuity means that GPs are capable of developing the most acute understanding of individuals' overall health. Providing over 24 million consultations each year, they are integral to improving Scotland's health and well-being, and they are integral to the objective to shift the balance of treatment and care from hospitals towards primary settings. The Your GP Cares campaign highlights the need for this patient shift to be accompanied by an appropriate resource transfer investment in primary care team personnel and practice infrastructure. And it draws our attention to the challenges posed by the changing needs of patients. In the gallery today is Dr Alan McDevitt, chairman of the BMA's Scottish GP committee. And he tells us there are more patients to see, more test results to read and more paperwork. Yet there are still the same number of hours in the day and many GP surgeries are simply overwhelmed. ISD Scotland data shows the number of patient contacts with GPs and practice nurses has increased by 10% during the last decade. 12% of registered patients now visit their local practice 10 or more times a year. The intense workload can in part be attributed to our growing ageing population and the need to support people living longer with complex, chronic or multiple health conditions. Long-term conditions already account for the majority of consultations. But the prevalence of conditions such as dementia will soar as the number of people aged over 75 doubles during the next 20 years. The demands upon general practice are particularly acute in my own North East region and there is real concern that it is affecting GPs' ability to best care for their patients. Official statistics show six of the biggest 20 practices in Scotland by patient list size are in the North East. Many serve areas with burgeoning populations. Two possess more than 20,000 patients. Facilities are already creaking, and yet the third national planning framework published this week reminds us that the North East population will grow by 23% by 2035. A question mark still hangs over the provision of a medical centre for the new town of Chapelton, a development providing up to 8,000 homes. And this has caused my constituents to fear in the nearby Port Lethem Medical Centre, already one of the busiest in the country, that it could soon be overwhelmed. Elsewhere, staff at Ellen Health Centre are striving to provide for a growing community. However, they are hampered by premises that are no longer fit for purpose, built when the town was a fraction of its current size. NHS Grampian says it will be some years before it is replaced. Such situations are common across Scotland. Scottish Liberal Democrats believe that communities know best how to run locally responsive services and it would be remiss of me not to note that the Scottish Government seized control of health boards' capital budgets. Stripped of powers to tackle infrastructure problems as they see fit, this year NHS Grampian will receive less than 2% of the non-formula capital spend for specific projects. Presiding officer. The Cabinet Secretary for Health this week confirmed to my colleague Jim Hume that the proportion of NHS budget spent on primary medical services has fallen under this government. Peaking at 9.1 under the Liberal Democrat Labour administration, spending has since fallen to 7.5% this year. Now, general practice is the gateway to the wider NHS. Clinical decisions made here commit more than half of total NHS expenditure. The Scottish Government must therefore ensure it is sufficiently resourced to take the right decisions. 
and it must ensure opportunities to build relationships with patients, understand their needs and effectively communicate what is happening. This must be enhanced, not diminished, as care shifts from acute to primary settings. Indeed, GPs' workloads have already soared as the profession struggles to attract and retain talent. Young doctors appear to be pursuing other specialisms. In Aberdeenshire CHPs, the number working part-time has increased by 9% in the last five years alone. Worryingly, with more than a third of staff in their 50s, I am told early retirements are up. Others are emigrating in search of a better work-life balance. The Scotsman reports this morning that over 30 practices across Scotland are operating on an open but full policy, only accepting registrations on a limited basis. But Dr McDevitt tells us that many wouldn't be able to take on a new doctor, even if they wanted to. The Scottish Government must therefore intensify its efforts to attract and retain GPs and reverse the losses experienced during the last three years. In closing, we cannot expect GPs and practice staff to spend more time with patients and provide more appropriate care closer to home without sufficient resources, additional staff or appropriate facilities. As the nature of primary care changes, it's imperative that health boards and GPs are capable of responding to local needs and demands. They must be empowered to provide integrated, sustainable primary health care services, services rooted in communities, focused on every aspect of patients' health, delivered in a fitting environment and of the highest quality. I would be grateful if the Minister could therefore tell us whether he considers the current distribution of total NHS expenditure to be appropriate. Will the Minister hand back some power over capital spending, back to boards, or will he ensure a fairer allocation? And I would welcome details of how he intends to attract and retain the staff required to deliver shared objectives, including enhancing preventative care, reducing hospital admissions, and tackling the unacceptable number of delayed discharges, and indeed integrating adult health and social care services. Thank you. Thank you. We are quite tight for time today. Could I ask members to keep to the four minutes, please? Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by Graeme Day. Uh, presiding officer, I'd like to congratulate Alison McInnes for bringing forward this uh, important debate and obviously support the uh, Your GP Cares uh, campaign. I think it's running in tandem with one from the Royal College of General Practitioners called Put Patients First Back General Practice. And it was actually from members of the Royal College of General Practitioners uh, that I learned some of the details of this at a meeting some time ago. And I think the key thing here is to look at the percentage of NHS spending going into general practice, and it's declined from somewhere over 9% a decade ago to somewhere over 7% uh, now. And that, of course, is at a time when the number of consultations uh, in primary care has been going uh, up. Uh, again, Alison McKinnis has quoted, uh, quoted a general figure of a 10% increase uh, over the same period. Much of that, of course, from practice nurse consultations, but GP consultations have also been going significantly uh, up. So that's already happening. And as we look to the future, of course, this uh, need for more work to be done uh, in primary care will be accentuated. There's the uh, elderly, uh, the growing elderly uh, population. Uh, obviously, there's the whole policy shift of the balance of care towards primary care, which have been supported by successive governments uh, over uh, the last uh, decade, and also the issues mentioned in the motions in motion in relation to delivering preventative care and the integration of health uh, and social care. So clearly, uh, there is a, a big challenge uh, for the NHS here and, and the fundamental thing is that the proportion of resources going into primary care is going to have to shift significantly. I realise that is not easy because we all know about the pressures on the hospital services as well but it is quite clear that this shift uh, has to take uh, place and uh, I know that the government is beginning to engage with this. Um, for example, when I wrote to the uh, Cabinet Secretary about this, he referred to uh, shifting some money, 36 uh, million from the quality and outcomes framework into the core GP contract. I think that's not extra money for general practice, but clearly it means that that money can be spent uh, differently, although I think the quality and outcomes framework has been a generally positive development since the first GP contract 10 years ago. The other opportunity, of course, is the new GP contract, which I think in Scotland is currently being uh, negotiated, and that presents a great opportunity to address some of these issues, and I'll be interested to hear what the Minister says about progress uh, on that. 
Now, we do have particular challenges uh, in Edinburgh and my own constituency in relation to this. Alison McInnes referred to the burgeoning population of the northeast of Scotland, which I'm pleased to hear about, but I think the part of Scotland with the most rapidly growing population uh, is uh, Edinburgh, and certainly I get um, quite a few letters from constituents of mine who are finding it difficult to uh, access a practice in my constituency. Obviously, in due course, they all do find somewhere, and I'm glad that NHS Lothian uh, is uh, opening up um, a new practice in the Leith Community Treatment Centre, but uh, that is not going to address the problem. And the Health Board realises that. They've commissioned two reports, and basically they've said that we need 33 new P uh, GP surgeries uh, in Lothian uh, in uh, the uh, near future. So obviously uh, we'll all be keeping a close watch on what those reports recommend, and I hope that they do come up with proposals very soon. And it's not just um, the actual number of practices, that's also the quality of practices. Uh, almost a third of existing buildings, uh, GP buildings uh, in Lothian need extending or modernising. And I'm told by my own GP, who is uh, absolutely uh, superb, that, uh, that her practice, uh, my practice, is actually uh, top of the list for that modernisation work. So obviously I have a close personal interest in this, which I should uh, declare. We also have the more uh, general issues about the difficulty of recruiting GPs, the time lag for training. So there are many challenges here uh, and uh, it clearly has to be a priority uh, for the government to address uh, these major issues. Many thanks. I call Graham Day to be followed by Nanette Milne. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I begin by congratulating Alan, Alison McInnes for bringing this matter here for debate. The BMA Scotland campaign, Your GP Cares, highlights a number of important issues, although perhaps one has, has shone a light on that they perhaps had not intended to. The future delivery of services in our communities, especially rural communities, is worthy of consideration right now, not least of all because, beyond any doubt, fractures have developed in the relationship between the general public and general practitioners. The principal cause of this, if my mailbag is anything to go by, is the difficulty people encounter when seeking to secure surgery-based appointments, let alone getting home visits. Now, having spent half a day shadowing a busy GP's practice in Carnoustie last year, I am not without sympathy for some of the challenges faced by those charged with delivering the services. There is unquestionably an issue over attracting locums and indeed the next generation of GPs. Demand for appointments in Carnoustie itself is 50 per cent higher than the national average. Iron ironically, up and coming GPs encounter a greatly reduced workload in surgeries based in some deprived city areas compared to more affluent rural parts such as Angus, and that draws many to the conurbations. The likes of Carnoustie and nearby Monty Feath also have a growing ageing population with the service demand that presents. And although NHS Tayside responded to this with a pilot project over the winter months, which aimed to assist in dealing with the dementia sufferers and prevent avoidable hospital admissions, and which was so successful as to be extended, these issues won't go away. And of course, there's the bane of any GP practices lives. The patients who want a doctor to remove a splinter from their finger, or to provide antibiotics for a cold, or who insist upon seeing a specific GP. It is, however, worth noting, presiding officer, that GP numbers in Scotland have actually gone up 5.7 per cent under this gov government, and that the sum invested in primary care services in 2012 13 was 10 per cent more than in 2006. And in the interest of balance, it must be said that whilst additional resources, if available, are practically redeployable, could alleviate and would alleviate the situation, so too would doctors working the kind of hours the wider public do. I met with a GP practice partner recently after they contacted me over the campaign. They pointed out the levels of depression, stress, divorce, alcoholism within the medical profession and told me that if we politicians would answer one plea from medics, it would be not to ask more of GPs because as a profession they simply cannot cope and we'd be put in a position where mistakes would be made. Yet they readily acknowledged their present contracted working week consisted of just eight clinical sessions with a further session set aside for paperwork. The general practitioners play a vital role in the health service, acting as they do as gatekeepers. We would not want them being placed under such strain that they were making errors. But are we really saying that that sort of working week represents an appropriate return on what, for partners in a GP practice, is a substantial salary, especially when there is an increasing demand for access to services, which somehow has to be met? There is a case to be made for redeployment of financial resources as more services are delivered in our communities, but there has to be give and take on this because the Scottish Government cannot somehow magic up additional sums of money for GP practices. Do you have... Alison McInnes, briefly. I'm a little disturbed by the, 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 the angle that you're taking. Um, uh, you must surely understand that the GP's workload is significantly more than the patient contact time. Graeme Day. 
I was simply reflecting the experiences I've had in my own constituency, presiding officer, presiding officer talking to GPs. Neil Fanley, briefly. Given what he's just said, I wonder if the member would then suggest a working week or a number of hours or how he sees uh, GPs working uh, in his world. Graeme Tay. Presiding officer, I'm simply making the point that there has to be compromise here if we're going to make progress on this, and we have to look at it in the round. The BMA are quite entitled to speak out on behalf of their members, but so too are the RCN. And it was interesting to note from the briefing that the RCN provided ahead of this debate that whilst the number of GP visits, uh, rather visits to GP practices, has increased from around 21.7 million in 2003-04 to 24.2 million in 2012-13, GP consultations had seen an increase of just 3.9% compared to 31% for practice-employed nurses. And if we consider how health-related services should be delivered locally, then we need also to look at the role being played by other organisations, an example of which is the community drop-in service being provided by Action and Hearing Loss Scotland. Since this service started in Angus in 2010, the organisation has retrieved 2,700 hearing aids, carried out 2,200 interventions and distributed almost 26,000 hearing aid batteries all reducing the workload of the NHS, evidenced by reviewed figures which show that over the past three and a half years, service users spared having to go to nine wells of Stokato have travelled 17,000 fewer miles. Yet as things stand, that isn't matched by funding moving from the NHS to action on hearing loss, although the organisation will shortly be chapping the door of NHS Tayside. And meanwhile, one GP practice locally has, I'm told, announced that it's no longer willing to dispense hearing aid batteries because staff don't have the time. In summary, presiding officer, I think there is a debate to be had on this subject, but it needs to be a balanced one, one which sees all sides willing to compromise in the interests of ensuring the needs of the patients are best met. Thank Many you. thanks. Nanette Mellon to be followed by Neil Finlay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I welcome this debate and I congratulate Alison McInnes on securing parliamentary time for it. I readily acknowledge the increasing demands on primary care at the present time and the pressures these are causing for GPs and their practice teams, leading to difficulty in recruiting and retaining new entrants. Thanks to the BMA's Your GP Cares campaign, these pressures are becoming more widely known within the Scottish community, and that is a good thing. There have been issues with primary care throughout my 11 years in the Parliament, and a decade ago I was happy to support the 2004 GP contract, which removed the 24-7 responsibility for patients from GPs, because at that time too it was very difficult to recruit and retain younger doctors, who in growing numbers were unwilling to accept the round-the-clock commitment of their predecessors. Over the ensuing years, there have been significant concerns, of course, about out-of-hours care provision, particularly in some of the more remote parts of Scotland, and NHS 24 took some time to settle in and be generally accepted by the public. The primary care medical, force has become, medical workforce has become increasingly part-time, partly due to the predominance of female doctors who want a work-life balance which fits with their parenting role, but also due to an increasing number of men who combine general practice with other part-time appointments, for example in teaching or hospital work. In the meantime, patient demand has escalated, coupled with bigger list sizes, and the demographic change means that more patients are living longer with comorbidities and more complex medical conditions. And all of this at a time of financial stringency when spending has to be carefully planned and controlled. The NHS in Scotland has benefited from the UK Government's decision to protect the NHS budget and the Scottish Government's decision to ring-fence the ensuing bar Barnet consequentials for the Scottish Health budget. My party, of course, hasn't agreed with all the Scottish Government's policy decisions on how to spend that money, for instance, on free prescriptions for higher-rate taxpayers who can afford to pay. But we have campaigned for more investment in primary care through restoring a universal GP-attached health visitor service. And so we do very much welcome last week's announcement of 500 new health visitor posts, which I think will be of significant support to GPs, particularly in the more deprived parts of the country. Likewise, we were pleased with the recent changes to the Scottish contract, which have removed some of the bureaucratic box ticking and allowed GPs to have a bit more face-to-face -face contact with their patients. However, in the face of growing pressures on the service, the Government's 2020 vision for more care to be provided in the community and the integration of health and social care, which will require to have GPs and the primary care team at its heart if it's to be successful, then I do think there's to be a good hard look at how services will be provided in the future, with the Scottish community involved at the heart of the debate. I would endorse the BMA's concern about the need for fit-for-purpose primary care premises. 
In the North East, we've seen a few excellent developments recently, like the Calcis seat and Woodside Health Centres in Aberdeen, and we look forward to the approved new health centre in Inverurie. But there are concerns in my area, as Alison McInnes has rightly pointed out, with rapidly growing populations throughout Aberdeenshire and new settlements being built, for example, around Port Lethen, without provision of the primary care facilities which will be needed by the increased population. And there's a need to replace buildings like the Forrester Hill Health Centre in Aberdeen, where my husband used to work, which was state-of-the-art when it opened in 1979, but which is now well past its sell-by date. So to conclude, presiding officer, the motion we are discussing raises some very serious issues which ca cannot, I think, be dealt with adequately in such a short debate. And I do think they merit much fuller discussion within this chamber during a plenary session of the Parliament. I hope the Minister will pay heed to this. And once again, can I commend Alison McInnes for drawing the BMA's campaign to our attention. Thank you. Many thanks. Neil Finlay. Officer, and uh, can I congratulate Alison McInnes on bringing this debate forward. As we heard at um, First Minister's question time on Monday, Brian Keithley, the well-respected outgoing chairman of the BMA Scotland, gave his farewell speech to the conference. And in it, he compared the NHS to the Titanic and said it was teetering on the brink, highlighting a whole range of issues from cancer treatment to care, the care crisis to hospital food. And he said, what I've seen over the past five years is the continuing crisis management of the longest car crash in my memory, and it's time for our politicians to face up to some very hard questions. I want to Mr Finlay, could we relate this to you, Chief? Well, I am just about to, uh, President Officer. I want to put on record my thanks to Dr Keithley for both his commitment and service to the BMA, but also for his willingness to be so, so frank. Uh, 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 and, uh, and In fact, he agrees with what we have been saying for the last two years, because it's simple, President Officer. The NHS in Scotland cannot go on as it is, and the government cannot continue to pretend that they can gloss over deep-seated problems with spin and bluster. And just one of those concerns is GP provision, because GPs are in the very front line of the system, well, with people living longer, with multiple complex health problems, and with rising demand and expectation. The pressure on our community GP practices grows by the day. In my own region, uh, there are, actually, in fact, 26 GP practices, according to NHS Lothian, that have either completely or partially closed their lists. Patients cannot get access to their local doctor. We have recruitment problems, especially in rural areas, and budgets have been cut by 2 per cent, as we have heard. And of course, it is in our most deprived communities that pressures in the NHS and GP practices are at their most pressing. I met recently with some Glasgow GPs, and they were operating in one of the deep end practices. They told me about the vast number of complex and extremely time-consuming cases they have to deal with. And yet that practice had gone without a health visitor for over a year and they had never met the social workers who deal with their clients. I find that both astonishing and thoroughly depressing. They also raised the issue of the inverse care law, which entrenches health inequalities, giving similar levels of funding to wealthy, healthy areas as it does to areas of deprivation and poor health. So I welcome the work of the, the Deep End GPs and the Your GP Cares campaign highlighting the need to develop premises, strengthen practice teams and attract new entrants. These are vital for all of our constituents. As a councillor, I drove through a project in my community which brought together two GP practices, sports facilities, a library, a dentist, a cafe, a pharmacy and brought in Job Centre Plus and a range of services in a new purpose-built facility. This is how I see community services developing. So the GPs there now prescribe swimming or gym sessions rather than drugs. They refer on to housing and the job centre and have immediate access to dental and pharmacy services. GPs working collaboratively to deliver better outcomes for patients. That's the service integration that we're seeing in West Lothian and I would commend others to follow that example. Finally, I have to say I was surprised by the inference by Graham Day that G GPs are not working flexibly or, appropri or appropriate numbers of hours. I would ask Mr Day to reflect on this argument. It's a bit like people observing this parliament and saying, why do we pay these people almost 60,000 a year, yet they're only there three afternoons a week? I think the irony of his argument has passed him by. Thank you. Um, I now invite the Minister to respond to the debate. Uh, Michael Matheson, you have up to seven minutes, please. 
Thank you, President Officer. Uh, like everyone in this chamber, I want to offer my congratulations to Alison McInnes in securing time for this debate, but also, uh, as we've all done is, uh, so far, has recognised the uh, fantastic job that our general uh, uh, practitioners do in Scotland, providing a vitally important service at the very heart of our vision of delivering an integrated health and social care uh, system. Uh, and in recognising the key role that GPs uh, play within our system, it's important we make sure that we have a processing system in place that allows them to maximise the potential that they can play in helping to shape health and social care within a community uh, setting. But as a, a number of members have uh, recognised in their own contributions, Alison McInnes uh, made reference to, as did Malcolm Chisholm in his own contribution, about the uh, stark challenges which we face in terms of the demographic shift that we are facing uh, as a country by 2033. The number of people over 75 is likely to have increased by almost 60 per cent. And with age, as with poverty, uh, comes a higher chance of having a long-term illness and the uh, long-term conditions that many individuals uh, will have at that point in their life. These are real challenges, and we need to make sure that we do the right work in order to help to support uh, general practice and the profession within the NHS to be able to meet those challenges. And I want uh, to uh, make some reference to some of the actions that we're taking in order to help to support our GPs in meeting these challenges. We've been working closely with the profession to modernise the GP contract and to transform our approach to the delivery of primary care. Um, in the 2014-15 uh, General Medical Services contract in Scotland, we, uh, we have been negotiated, have been negotiated and agreed with the Scottish General Practitioners uh, Committee. It brings direct benefits both to patients uh, and also in reducing bureaucracy uh, for GPs by reducing around 30 per cent of the cough that Malcolm Chisholm made reference to. What that does is it helps to provide greater financial stability for individual practices uh, by transferring around £36 million, which was assigned to COF, into the core contract for those GP practices, placing a greater opportunity for them to make judgments on how that resource should be used uh, and to provide them with greater flexibility around clinical judgments and how they can best meet the needs of their patients. The contract has also enabled each GP practice to become involved in integration planning and decision making by way of a lead GP to link with the local partnership organisations, which is a key part of the role that general practice needs to provide in going forward. And each practice as part of the contract will also undertake a review of access uh, and also participate in a programme of quality improvement. The 2014-15 contract also places greater trust on the professionalism of uh, GPs, and I believe that it gives us a good platform for some of the further development work that needs to take place in order to find a, and create a sustainable uh, general practice provision in Scotland. And, uh, overall, uh, this government's ambition with the uh, GP contract is one which will enable GPs to get the time to do what they really want to do, uh, and that is to work with individuals to ensure their medical care is right for them, their families, their carers, and within their local environment. I'll give way to the member. Malcolm Chisholm. Mr Chisholm, the, the could you move your microphone? The has actually been finalised. He, he talked about the 2014-15. I wonder if there's still negotiations, or is that it now for the foreseeable future? As it Minister, was. I hope you caught that. So we have, we have agreed for the 2014-15, the issues about building and that and going forward and how we can make sure that the contract moving forward is one uh, which we can shape that reflects the needs for general practice in Scotland uh, going forward. And we'll do that with the uh, Scottish General Practice uh, Committee in order to how we can develop that to make sure that reflects uh, the values and needs we have, but also to tackle issues such as recruitment and retention, uh, as was highlighted by Alison McInnes and uh, Annette Milne in their own uh, contributions. Can I also say there's also a range of work that can take place out with the contract in order to modernise uh, general practice. And it should be recognised that there is actually uh, a tremendous amount of very innovative and uh, uh, improvement exercises which are already been undertaken at a local level. And we're working with a, a number of practices to understand what works and how it works. Uh, we've also uh, provided £1 million uh, this year to the primary care modernisation programme in order to look at how we can make sure that we build on areas where good practice has been identified. And the first stage of that uh, involves the, a programme uh, with the strategic assessment of primary care by each of our health boards, which should be conducted at a local level uh, and should form part of their local planning process for 2014-15. 
We are also co-funding a programme of work uh, which has been led by NHS Highland in order to uh, develop and test models for healthcare delivery, which is sustainable within remote and rural areas, some £1.5 million in order to allow them to test out different models of how we can meet the challenge of both recruitment and retention, particularly uh, in rural areas, and the model of care uh, that can best meet the needs of those local communities. Can I turn, uh, though, to the point that I think Alison McInnes uh, made and was also referred to by the Net Millen around the uh, planning of housing developments within local areas and the pressure that can then place on uh, local uh, service delivery. Health boards are uh, key uh, participants in the development of local development plans, uh, and that is to allow for the planning of sufficient health care provision uh, in relation to any local development plan that has been taken forward by uh, by a local authority. Scottish planning policy makes it clear uh, that local authorities must take account of the availability of public services and infrastructure when assessing sites for new housing developments, including areas such as primary health care uh, provision. And these must be seen as being part of the core uh, purpose of carrying out that local assessment process. I will give way to Nanette Millen. Nanette Millen, briefly, please, the Minister's in his final minute. Okay. Are you happy? Right. Um, thank you for taking the intervention. Um, just would, you, would the minister accept that there, there is a sort of time lag between <clears throat> the developments that we're currently faced with and the projected medical facilities some years down the line, and there's going to be a significant gap in the middle, which, which is what was worrying both Alison McInnes and myself. Minister. Well, that's why this has got to be a key part of local authorities and their local planning process, which does go years ahead. And that's why it's in the planning policy in order to make sure that should be happening effectively. If local authorities are not doing that, then from what uh, Alison McInnes uh, appears to be suggesting from a sedentary position, is the case, then that's a matter that has to be pursued vigorously with the local authority to ensure that it is part of their local development plan and it is being taken account of. But I do recognise some of the specific pressures that are being experienced. I'm conscious that the presiding officer is keen for this debate to finish on time. Can I say uh, there are a range of other areas that were taking forward work and providing resource support to general practice in Scotland. But I hope, presiding officer, I've set out today some of the challenges which we as a government uh, are seeking to take forward as part of our uh, delivery of the 2020 vision for health and social care. But members can be assured that we see general practice as being key to delivering the best quality of health care we can for individuals at a local level, and we will continue to work with partners in the BMA and within the healthcare sector overall to make sure that we continue to deliver that in the years to come. Thank you very much, Minister. That concludes Alison McInnes' debate on your GP Cares campaign, and I now suspend this meeting of Parliament until 2.30pm.